Hey guys, it's Stephen here, back with another episode of 5 Things That We Learned, and this time we're taking a closer look at Manchester City's 3-1 victory, a tough, horrible game, uh, but a 3-1 victory nonetheless away at Cheltenham Town. It was a very memorable game, it is loads of talking points, so I'm going to dive through that today, but before I do that, as ever, I want to say thank you to the wonderful people over at OneFootball, it's an absolutely awesome app, genuinely fantastic, and as you can see on screen right now, it's your one one-stop source of all the information you need from around the football world. And it's not just Manchester City either. You can stay up to date with the big transfer news from across the game and also find out stats from all your rival players and all that kind of stuff. And of course, get up to date with Manchester City news and Manchester City transfers and Manchester City stats and all that kind of stuff. So download One Football right now in the link in the description below. It really helps support my channel and I promise you, you won't regret it. It costs absolutely zero pence. I've been using it for around two years myself. Now it's a genuinely brilliant app worth your time and once again it helps support my channel a little bit go download it right now in the link in the description when you've downloaded it make sure to drop a comment letting me know you've done so and i'll reply to you over in the comment section as well but anyway guys let's move on to today's video and we're talking about five things that we took from this game um it was an interesting game, of course. A game full of crazy highs and crazy lows. And there's more I could possibly talk about than just these five points. But these are the ones that particularly stood out to me. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of more negative ones first before going into the more positive ones. And I've got to start with the Gabriel Jesus uh, mystery, the enigma that is Gabriel Jesus, because that man is incredibly frustrating. And I, in full disclaimer, I'm a fan of Gabriel Jesus. Um... What I will say, I'm going to add all the caveats first. Um, Gabriel Jesus hasn't played much football recently. He still is very much trying to regain fitness and form. And, and I don't think he's necessarily in big form at the moment in terms of confidence and self-belief. I'm going to add the caveat once again that obviously um, he's a very likable player in terms of his work rate. Obviously, he's got uh, loads of endeavour. He works really hard. He'll basically link up with his teammates very, very well. Um, and we know we can score goals regularly. He scored over 20 last season, despite being a backup striker and all that kind of stuff. And when he gets into hot streaks, he's not too bad. Um, but I will be honest and say that yesterday in front of goal, he really frustrated me. <laughs> Genuinely really frustrated me. He's got this very weird trait, Gabriel Jesus, of seemingly scoring sometimes his hardest chance that he gets. I think the one at the end that he actually scored in, um, was was harder than all the other ones he got. Genuinely, the one-on-one -on -one was a poor finish. A couple of headers were a little bit bit tragic, if I'm being totally honest. But the one at the end where he took him down and did a Burkamp-S spin and then fired it into the corner was one that you could have easily messed up, but he still took it anyway, which makes this... Gabriel Jesus' enigma, even more frustrating. And I can understand the frustrations of Manchester City fans saying he's just never going to be uh, clinical in front of goal. And to be honest, I, I kind of probably agree that he'll never be brilliant in front of goal. I do think there's a middle ground between where he is now and between where I want him to be that he probably will end up finding. I don't think he's going to be quite as poor at finishing as he is second. I think he'll improve a little bit, admittedly, and probably not loads, but I think he'll be a little bit less less hectic when he finds a bit more confidence. He's a needy, emotional person, Gabriel Jesus. I get that impression that when he misses, he puts his head down a little bit and doesn't lack the self-confidence enough, really, to be a clinical, ruthless bastard in front of goal. But having said that, a lot of people will talk about getting rid of him and all that kind of stuff. Personally, I don't really buy into that. You're probably going to struggle to find a backup striker who works as hard as he does. As such, um, he's such a likeable player in general in terms of his overall attitude um, and general usefulness. You're going to probably find a struggle to find a backup striker get as good as Gabriel Jesus in that instinct. I mean, I think we're judging him right now at his worst, but I think we know at his best he can have very big performances. We only have to go back as recently as the Real Madrid game, which is only a few months back, but he was absolutely fantastic. Scored a key goal and Jenny was uh, all over the place causing havoc. And obviously, obviously as well, drifting down the left side, which is a position that suits him. So personally, he's an enigma. This mystery that Gabriel Jesus is, is frustrating. I can't deny that. But personally, I want to give him a little bit more chance. But I don't deny that he is frustrating, unfortunately. So what we learned about him, probably not much at the same time. Next, uh, Laporte. Uh, let's talk about Laporte, um, and I've got a feeling he's going to have to wait for a chance for a while. Now, I don't think Laporte necessarily did anything wrong yesterday, especially not seriously wrong anyway. Um, I think Laporte was fine, he was perfectly okay. But the problem Laporte's got at the moment is that, quite simply, um, fine just isn't enough right now. When you've got two world-class centre-backs uh, playing currently, and I say world-class by their current form, if not their general ability anyway, and Diaz and Stones, when you've got two players who are that 
that on their game, that focused and that reluctant to make mistakes and they never do make mistakes, um, essentially you've got an impenetrable wall to cross. Not only are... Um, Diaz and Stones keeping opposition strikers out. They're also doing a very goddamn good job of keeping Laporte out as well. And other defenders at Manchester City. They are proving a defensive line in many ways. To the 11 and to the opposition 11. And it's very difficult for Laporte at the moment. Simply because um, even if he makes the tiniest mistake... That some people would argue maybe isn't even a mistake. But the point I'm saying, even if he shows something that is vaguely contentious, that some person could go as a mistake, some people go, eh, the kind of thing that you shrug off and forget after five minutes, that right now is exacerbated and highlighted into something bigger simply because Stones and Diaz's performance is so exceptional that the support has to be unequivocally perfect, absolutely flawless to get a chance. And yesterday for their goal, um, he looked a little bit weak in the header. Genuinely, he crumbled a little bit under a challenge. It wasn't a, a massive problem. Once again, it's the kind of thing usually you'd kind of brush off and go, eh, if he was in the midst of a great run of form, you'd probably ignore it. But it is a problem, unfortunately, when you've got Diaz uh, and Stones in great form. So for Laporte, he needed an impeccable game yesterday, which is not even fair, given the fact that he's barely played any football. But it's just one of those things where he needs football to prove he can be great, but he ain't going to get football unless he's perfect straight away because of Diaz and Stones. So, unfortunately, it feels like uh, Laporte at the moment and it happened at the Arsenal game as well, where he was a little bit, maybe he didn't choose the right man to follow for the, for the Arsenal's goal later on. It feels at the moment Laporte's got a ridiculously hard tax to get back into the team, so he may have to wait around. I'm not criticising him, I'm just trying to say at the moment, unless he gives anything other than a 10 out of 10, he's going to struggle to get ahead of those two, which unfortunately is the reality he's got to face. Uh, the third point I'd love to talk about is Tommy Doyle. Um... Tommy Doyle, to put it simply, is a very good footballer. Um, he, of course, is young. He, of course, has fine edges that need... He has edges that need refining and smoothing down and all this kind of stuff. He does need a bit of fine-tuning. There's some allergies I got wrong. Allergies? <laughs> Analogies that I got wrong there somewhere, but you know what I'm trying to get at. Um, but Tommy Doyle is clearly a good footballer. What I really like about Tommy Doyle is his professionalism. For such a young man, I think he's only 19 years old, he has such a level-headed approach to the game, and you can tell he's ultra-reliable. You can tell coaches love him, and he's a reason that he's captained England and Manchester City to so much success at youth level. Genuinely been a standout player uh, for the academy sides, and he's the reason that his teammates love him. He's a reason that coaches love him, and it's not because he's a very good footballer, and he clearly is. We all saw enough signs yesterday of that wicked right foot that he's got whipping in the crosses and set pieces, and we all saw his defensive um, awareness and all that kind of stuff. We all saw how uh, he's industrious and works really hard, but they love him because he's so willing to learn. He's so willing to improve and listen to his coach. They love him because he's so dedicated to his craft, um, and they love him as well um, because he gets it. He simply gets it. You know, if you're a coach and you understand that a certain player is going to be a perfect little lieutenant for you, and they get the desire to, they get the need to work hard, and also they get what makes this club so important to him because he literally breathes. He has blue blood running through those veins because obviously his granddad connection well that gives him a massive chance now what I'm saying he's probably not as explosive or natural a talent as Phil Foden we'll get onto him very shortly but who is We're talking about a guy who's genuinely generational here but doesn't mean Doyle is anything less than a fantastic talent um Doyle, for my, in my opinion, will be a little bit of a slow uh, burner in terms of getting towards the first team, but already he's shown that he belongs around a bunch of very good players, in my opinion, to at least learn the tools of the trade from the likes of Rodri, the likes of Fernandinho, Gundogan, De Bruyne, Bernardo Silva. Keep him around the first team a little bit. Occasionally trust him when we need someone to come off the bench if they're a little bit tired. I trust him in the cup games as well because I think he's showing that he won't let anyone down. And I think he was a little bit unlucky to be hooked yesterday, but Doyle's a good player. He doesn't have to explode into the the first team now but if you, I tell you what if you keep him around the first team by the time he's 21 22 you'd be surprised if he's playing 15 20 games a season being really useful by the time he's 23 all of a sudden he's playing 30 games a season slowly getting better slowly getting more useful I reckon that's the best place for me for him now let him learn from the very best because he's a good player and also you know that connection he's a blue he's one of us you can't deny it like Phil Foden. Phil Foden yesterday by far the most positive talking point from the game. Foden yesterday um, was majestic majestically brilliant, generally uh, one of his best performances yet in a Manchester City shirt, and I know it was only Cheltenham Town, and I know it was only a League 2 game, and I know obviously he had to do a bar in a City poor performance where we had to come back from 1-0 down against a lower team and all that kind of stuff, and I know all the caveats, but to be frank, I don't care. Yesterday wasn't about his technical ability, even though that was clearly on display, well it was a little bit, but for me the most impressive sign of Foden's growth in general was his willingness to take the game by the scruff of the net 
and drag Manchester City back into it. His desire, his endeavour, he looks a world apart from the young player from even a year ago. He was still very, very good. He looks like a man now who believes that he belongs in this first team. And not just the first team, the starting 11. And not even just the starting 11, but he belongs in that collective group of players that are so focused and so committed to uh, dragging Manchester City to victories. Basically, he looks like he believes um, he's one of the guys who can make a difference. And that confidence, that stepping confidence is an absolute game changer for a young player because they go from being a raw, uh, promising young player to the real deal. And Foden is no longer just potential. You're fucking damn right he's got loads of potential still, but he's more than just raw potential. He's now ability still scarily with this much potential to plonk right on top of that. The guy genuinely has the potential to be Manchester City's greatest ever player. And I don't use those words lightly. He's already absolutely fantastic. Can imagine another 10, 15 years of Phil Foden, which is not even unfeasible. Imagine the appearance records he could break. He could even break Aguero's goal-scoring record. He has uh, goals, uh, potential, uh, iconic status to his name, genuinely. The pace, the guile, the dribbling ability yesterday. Uh, once again, his ninth goal of the season. Manchester City's top scorer this year. <laughs> a kid that most people were saying wasn't getting enough game time until recently. And all of a sudden, he's our top scorer. Pop that in your pipe and smoke it, you bitter journos. Uh, Foden's been absolutely fantastic, and yesterday was a big step up in his step, um, his development step, I would say. A brilliant performance, one of the most important so far in his career. Majestic talent, a genuinely majestic talent. And once again, he gets it and believes us, uh, believes in this team. Finally, um, Gunselsius. <laughs> It doesn't kind of work. It's a compound for Gundogan, Cancelo and Diaz. The three Avengers that came on yesterday during the endgame battle to solve Manchester City's problem. Honestly, yesterday when these three were summoned from the bench, it reminded me of that little bit in Marvel's Avengers where they all returned through the portals on your left captain kind of thing for that final fight and it was like bringing on the big guns and just as Manchester City's hopes in this FA Cup looked like they'll be fading um, Gundogan Cancelo and Diaz stepped onto the pitch to stamp home their improved form at the moment Nicholas just walking in the back of the shot there but I'm going to carry on pretending that I haven't seen that <laughs> but Gundogan yesterday uh, Cancelo and Diaz what I loved about their little cameo is it highlighted just how much they have become the fulcrum of what makes Manchester City so so goddamn good at the moment honestly they are clearly in such a good place mentally, those three players. And I thought it was um, a brilliant decision, an absolutely brilliant decision from Guardiola to bring on Diaz. Me, your numbskull typical fan like the rest of us, were going, why is he bringing on a defender? But in hindsight, and of course we should have owed Guardiola that hindsight, uh, bringing on that defensive leader just to kind of get everyone steady, just to calm uh, those around Diaz. Diaz's mere presence on the pitch is enough to settle any nerves. It's enough to focus players. It's enough just to reorganise the whole team. A genuine leadership mentality. Him being on there, then you bring on someone like Gundogan who knows he's a million miles above the players he's playing against with all due respect to Cheltenham, knowing that he's in great form. Knowing that he's just spent 70 odd minutes sat watching the pockets of space that could potentially emerge for him as he came onto the pitch. He was so primed to make such an impact in this game and he clearly did get an assist right at the end. And likewise Cancelo, a man who clearly is playing in the form of his Manchester City career so far. Uh, his intelligence when he came on, his versatility, a very special player. Once again, like Foden, who's brilliant, he's still got a whole bucket full of potential to get even better, in my personal opinion. An assist, a pre-assist as well for another goal. Uh, Cancelo, uh, is absolutely flying at the moment and I absolutely love seeing those three players that we think are so key at the moment just come on and improve the performance in a way that we would hope that they did it's another confirmation of what we know about these brilliant players uh, yesterday wasn't a great performance but it still ended up with more good than it did bad because we got to see some wonderful wonderful um, little kind of uh, uh, I guess storylines emerge from this game and I'm very happy about it guys they are five things that I personally took I thought it was a very very interesting game let me know down the comments what you made of yesterday's game of course and also thank you to all the patrons who are currently scrolling down the side of the screen alongside me you're all absolute heroes don't forget as well to download one football in the link in the description below and for any second tier uh, youtube or patreon members uh the player ratings video will be up any minute now as well at the same time and later on as well there will be another transfer target um where i discuss all your questions as part of the snickers protein fan line for now though i'll see you later in a bit